Good afternoon and welcome back to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting that was uh, recessed this morning till one. And um, the first item for this afternoon's uh, business is uh, HIE, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Kinsler to tee up that conversation. Sarah? Sure, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Folks able to see the slides? We are. Excellent, thank you. Um, so for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, GMCB Director of Strategy and Operations, and I'm here to give a staff recommendation on the 2020 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan and the 2021 connectivity criteria. Um, quick timeline and process reminder, Steva submitted the plan to the board at the start of November. Um, we held a special public comment period on this topic through the month of November and received one, one written comment. Um, on November 18th, Steva and Vital presented the HIV plan and connectivity criteria, um, and I walked through the staff assessment of that submission. And then on December 1st, Steva resubmitted the HIV plan with some minor edits. Um, today, we'll hear a bit from Diva about that resubmission, and you'll receive a final staff recommendation. Um, regarding the resubmission, uh, following the board's discussion on November 18th and again on November 25th, uh, Diva resubmitted the HIE plan with some minor changes in four areas. And actually, um, we have Emily Richards, uh, HIE program um, director at Diva, on the line today, and she is going to speak to those changes herself. Sarah, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, Welcome, good. Emily. Thank you. Um, Sarah, if you go to the next slide, I, I've got the details there. Thanks. Um, so the first here is a reference to the new federal rule on price transparency. Thanks for the input um, from board member Pelham on that. Um, in late October, uh, CMS and um, uh, two other U.S. agencies released final rules on price transparency that require health system access uh, actors to uh, open up information about the costs of specific medical services. So if you remember, the Office of the National Coordinator and CMS have also recently released rules that call for uh, opening access to patient health records and claims data. Um, so uh, working in conjunction, uh, IT developers might look at this and say, okay, we're going to make applications uh, that open up all of this new data to patients. So that's a new piece of information that we added to the policy section in the plan to something for something to sort of look out for and plan for in the uh, next year or two ahead. Um, we added a note on timing of new data integration efforts. Um, the project timelines in the plan um, are expected to shift to better align with existing efforts, whether it's the all-payer model implementation and evaluation, um, the progress made on our social determinants of health pilot, um, or our work with the designated agencies as impacted by the COVID response work. So um, the timing there um, uh, is for illustration purposes and to ensure that um, folks are reading know that uh, we're considering all facets of the HIE ecosystem that will mm -hmm. impact how new data is integrated into the system, um, but we've added a note there uh, on the timing itself. Um, the third one here, clarification on next steps for social determinants of health. You may remember that we talked about uh, social determinants of health pilot um, between the Agency of Human Services and One Care Vermont, um, uh, supported by uh, grant work. Um, so the next step for that is for a population health subcommittee um, to take that pilot and consider how data would be integrated into the, onto the VHI um, and exchange social determinants of health data specifically. Um, and I added additional language here to clarify that that work will involve ensuring that confidentiality and protections of that data um, are at a minimum the same as how we treat health data today. Um, there's a lot of work ahead for that subcommittee to do, but it seemed important, um, as Board Member Pelham pointed out, to, to point out the fact that sort of the, um, the floor of our work will be ensuring confidentiality of, of the data as we do today. And finally, updates to the protocols for access to protective health on the VHI. Uh, Board Member Lunch had some great edits um, to add greater clarity to this description of when a public health authority can access data um, and uh, the definition of the public health authority itself. So those have been included in the, in the revision. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, does the board have any questions for Emily before we move toward the staff recommendation? 
I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you to Emily for her help in making those changes. Thank you. Ditto with for me too. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> I appreciate all the input. Thanks to you both. All right, thank you again. Um, so at the November 18th meeting, um, we walked through each of the principles for reviewing the HIE plan and the staff assessment. I won't repeat that assessment itself, but I want to note for board members and for others on the phone that those slides are attached at the end of the slide deck for your reference, and those are posted to the website if you'd like to re-review those. Um, none of the staff assessment has changed as a result of the changes that Diva um, made in the resubmission. Um, I do want to quickly remind us of the principles themselves, though, which can be summarized as uh, alignment with statute, the first and second principles you see here, um, whether the HIE plan meets the, the goals of other re recent relevant legislation, and whether the HIE plan incorporates national best practices and stakeholder input. Um, and for the connectivity criteria, we use two principles for the board's annual review, focusing on alignment with HIE plan goals and on the clar clarity of the criteria themselves, since these are really an operational tool. Um, lastly, I'll review the public comment before I make a staff recommendation. Uh, we received three public comments on the HIE plan and connectivity criteria. Um, two of those were verbal comments at the November 18th meeting, and those were on the role of VHI data in supporting contact tracing related to COVID-19 and on sharing sensitive data when it's not originating with a so-called part two provider. Um, we also received one written comment during the special public comment period from Bi-State Primary Care Association uh, in support of the updated plan. Um, so given the original staff assessment presented on the 18th, uh, the changes in the resubmission to address issues raised by, by the board um, in their discussions on November 18th and 25th, and the comments that we received from members of the public, staff has two recommendations. Uh, first, to approve the 2020 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan as resubmitted on December 1st and second to approve the 2021 connectivity criteria as submitted in the 2020 update to the HIE strategic plan on December 1st, noting that there were not changes to the connectivity criteria between the two versions. Thank you, Sarah. Are there questions from the board for Sarah? A question for our uh, legal counsel. Um, would this need to be um, in the form of one motion or two? Uh, I would recommend two. Okay. Before I ask a member of the board to uh, make a motion, is there any member of the public that wishes to make any further public comment? And I see that uh, Mort Wasserman has his hand up. Hi, I just have a question about price transparency and its relationship to the health information exchange. From my understanding, HIE is based on informatics standards, and I've not been able to find any mention of cost or price in those standards. It's a very clinically oriented tool to convey information about patients from one clinician to another. And because it has that, it also has the potential for one to extract information about it for health services, investigations. But I don't understand that there's even a place to put dollars in the uh, nuts and bolts, the information, the data, if you will, that actually go to the exchange. So my question is, is there? Oh, this is Emily. Is it okay for me to answer, or Sarah? Did you want to? I I was hoping that um, that I would could punt to you, Emily. <laughs> my, my understanding initially um, was was the same as yours. That Emily um, Emily and Board Member Pelham kind of helped me helped me understand how this could be relevant, in particular, to the new federal interoperability rule. So I'm going to let Emily take it away because I know she'll do a much better job of explaining it. <laughs> well, I, I think Mort is completely correct in his definition of what the Vermont Health Information Exchange does as a data tool, which aggregates health data um, for multiple purposes. And so what we're talking about with the price transparency rule is that it 
together with new rules from the Office of the National Coordinator and the Center for Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, which call for uh, actors like health information exchanges to open up data um, together, working together, those um, new rules may result in IT developers who develop applications for our phones to pull together different data from sources. So they might pull uh, clinical data for health records from the health information exchange, and they might pull pr price transparency information thanks to that new price transparency rule and present them together in one application for a person to understand uh, both their personal health record and the cost of um, uh, potential services and services that they've already received. So that's, um, that's our guess at what might happen. Um, but so we're pulling together all of this information to um, inform how we might, you know, develop our strategic plan or uh, make program decisions going forward based on the availability of data to individuals on their phones. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it sounds like a really big stretch, that's all, just because they have to get the price information or cost information, and goodness knows those things are pretty strange from one place to another, uh, from somewhere. Uh, they get them directly from the providers. Uh, most pra practicing clinicians have no idea what is being charged when they submit um when they have a patient encounter. So it, it just sounds like there's a lot of groundwork to be done. And I was curious why it made its way into something that was a strategic plan for the HIE, that's all. But yeah, that's a good answer. I, I, I think if you look at the change the change that was made to this plan, the plan in this area more, you'll see that it's really focused on what um, kind of outside actors or third parties might be interested in doing as this develops in, um, you know, nationally as, as the price transparency rule goes into effect, as well as the interoperability rule. So it's less, um, the focus is less on what um, Vermont might do through the Beehive and more on kind of the national perspective. Got it. Thank you. Happy to follow up on that more, though, if after, if after um, you know, thinking about what you heard today, you have more questions. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment? Hearing none, would a board member wish to make a motion? I can make a motion. Um, this is Robin. I I move that we approve the 2020 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan as resubmitted on December 1st. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the 2020 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan as resubmitted on December 1st. Is there further board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Would a board member wish to make a second motion? Sure. Uh, I move that we approve the 2021 connectivity criteria as submitted in the 2020 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan on December 1st. Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved and seconded to approve the 2021 connectivity criteria as submitted in the 2020 update to the Health Information Ex Exchange Strategic Plan on December 1st. Is there further board discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. So next, we're going to move on to um, a discussion on the ACO um, financial results, and I'm going to call on Sarah Lindbergh to tee that up and introduce the panel. Sounds good. I'm just going to wait for the slides to pop up. Yep, Sarah, it's Michelle. I'm working on that right now.
All right. Can you all see my screen? We can, yes. I can, everybody probably can. <laughs> Gotta love the rural internet. Um, so, hi, my name is Sarah Lindbergh. Uh, I work for the Green Mountain Care Board and head up our analytical team. And I'm here to kick off um, some findings for the ACO's financial results for calendar year 2019. Um, I will talk about our Medicare program and I'll be followed by our partners over at DIVA who uh, administer the Medicaid program with the ACO. And that will be Alicia Cooper and Corey Gustafson. Gustafson. Um, from Blue Cross Blue Shield, we will have Grace Gilbert Davis to talk about their results, and we'll wrap up with Tom Boris from One Care Vermont. Um, please keep in mind that these are um, the financial results for the ACO program in 2019. Later on, you will be hearing about the all payer model results to date for calendar year 2019. Those are broader um, results for all Vermont residents. These are um, associated with people attributed to the ACO. So this is a much narrower group of people. So with that, we can advance to the Medicare financial performance results. So uh, this is uh, blatantly stolen from our partners over at DIVA to try and help demonstrate how the risk corridor works for Medicare. So the dashed red line in the middle shows what the financial target ended up being for 2019, also known as the benchmark, and that was $496 million. Uh, the risk around that, the total risk is a symmetric corridor, and in 2019, it was a 5% corridor. So to the left in purple, you would see the potential savings of which the ACO shares a 100%, and that was $24.8 million. So if the total cost of care ends up coming in less, so they spent less on the people attributed to the ACO, they would save and up to a maximum amount of just under $25 million. Similarly, there's a loss corridor um, on the upside. So if spending ends up being in excess of that target, that's the ACO's responsibility. So if you go to the next slide, um, the ACO performed uh, in the savings corridor. So the total cost of care for their performance ended up at $484 million. So that um, resulted in a savings of $11.1 .1 million, which included a deduction of just under $200,000 due to their quality performance. Um, and of that, uh, $6.3 million were advanced to the ACO. So 57% of those savings they received in advance to help fund the Medicare participation in uh, the primary care medical home program and the community health team through the blueprint as well as the SASH program. So um, the net value was whatever 11.1 .1 minus 6.3 is. I, I took a book out of Robin Lund's page and I won't do math publicly. Uh, but <laughs> um, but <clears throat> pardon me, the reason that the advance was uh, relatively less than it was in 2020 and even 2018 was that uh, the way it was administered is that there it was always based on the year before. And because uh, there was a 80-20 split in the risk sharing in 2018, they were only eligible to advance 80% of that of value. So in 2020, we kind of changed the methodology a little bit because um, the cash flow to support that program um, can be pretty onerous. So that is the financial results for Medicare in 2019. Any questions I can address before turning it over to our colleagues over at DIVA? Any questions for Sarah? If not, go ahead and turn it over to uh, Corey and Alicia. Happily. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alicia Cooper from the Department of Vermont Health Access. I'll go ahead and kick us off. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come to speak with all of you today. We will be summarizing in this presentation the 2019 performance results for the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program. Um, we'll primarily focus on the financial results, but we do have some high-level summary slides that will speak to some of the other results and will point you in the direction of a more comprehensive report for anyone who's interested in digging into the details. Next slide, please. 
So this is a slide that I believe we've shown before, and we wanted to just use this as a starting point to reiterate that the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program is reinforced by DIVA's three priorities. Uh, these priorities are listed on the slide, and they relate to value-based payment, information technology projects, and performance. The VMNG program primarily intersects with priorities one and three. Uh, it's one of the programs that allows Medicaid to be a more predictable and reliable payer partner and is probably the, the largest program that Medicaid currently has for transitioning payments away from a fee-for-service construct and toward a value-based payment model. The program also allows us to focus on continual incremental programmatic and performance improvement. So not only are we looking for improvements uh, at the program level when we're thinking about financial and quality results on a year over year basis, we're also thinking about ways that we as the, the Medicaid team working with One Care can continue to make the program uh, more efficient and um, more innovative for our Vermont Medicaid members who are touching the program. And finally, this program gives us the opportunity to align with other payer programs, including the Medicare and commercial programs. And it gives us opportunities to be an innovative leader. Hopefully those also give us future opportunities for alignment. Um, but one of the areas where the Medicaid program has been able to use um, the, the VMNG model as a way to test new things has been in how we think about attribution. Um, we've tried some changes to our attribution methodology over time, and we'd be happy to spend a little bit more time talking about that if that's of interest later. Next slide, please. Just as a reminder to everyone, the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO contract term began with an original contract for the 2017 performance year, which was a one-year agreement with four optional one-year extensions. Eva and One Care have used one-year extensions for each the 2018, 2019, and 2020 performance years, and we're currently in the process of negotiating a final one-year extension for the 2021 performance year. Rates are renegotiated annually based on the specific attributed population that we have for each year, and reconciliation may occur more frequently if necessary. Next slide. So before we move into the, the content, I'll just note that on that prior slide, there is a link um, at the bottom that will take you to the full 2019 VMNG results report on DIVA's website. Uh, that's where you've got some more detail on all of the things that we'll be talking about today, if you'd like to reference that further. Next slide. The first result that we wanted to highlight is that the Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program continues to grow. We have seen additional providers and communities joining the ACO network to participate in the program um, year over year. And in this slide, you can see a table of each of our performance years thus far with some estimates for a 2021 performance year as well. Um, we've seen growth in the number of health service areas participating in each year, and we're starting to level out as we look at 2020 and 2021. We've also seen some growth in the number of unique Medicaid providers who are participating with a little bit of a dip from 2020 to 2021. And we've also seen sort of corresponding to the number of providers participating an increasing number of Medicaid members who are attributed to the program. And then the final row in this table just shows the percent change over the prior year. And I think what's particularly notable, and we'll talk more about this as we get further into the presentation, is that um, going from 2018 to 2019, we saw some really remarkable growth in the number of Medicaid members who were attributed in each year um, relative to one another, with almost 88% increase um, happening in those two years. Um, in 2020, and as I mentioned previously, uh, we're, we had worked with OneCare to do a little bit of 
um, innovation around the attribution methodology used for the Medicaid Next Gen program. Um, as a result, we had sort of in combination a traditional attribution methodology, which was similar to what's been used uh, since the beginning of the program. And then on top of that, an expanded attribution methodology that helped us uh, bring some more Medicaid members into the ACO program that using traditional attribution approaches that align more closely with the Medicare approach would not have been considered eligible for attribution otherwise. And so that is something that we are continuing to employ as we think about a 2021 performance year. Alicia, can I ask you a clarifying question on this slide? Certainly. So I, I'm just curious about um, the, the jump in the uh, attributed members, um, whether that um, there's also a tie to an increase of uh, people on the Medicaid program, or um, is it strictly just uh, changes in numbers of participating uh, providers? It primarily relates to the numbers of participating providers, uh, because when we're looking at attribution, in particular, uh, the traditional attribution, which is what we had for both 2018 and 2019, we're looking at historic primary care utilization as the basis for that kind of attribution relationship. So even if we have more recent increases in the overall Medicaid population, we wouldn't have been picking them up uh, using that historic information uh, were it not for the significant change in the provider participation that we saw from year to year. Um, we do certainly notice that as we have a, a larger sort of Medicaid population overall, there are more individuals that can then potentially be identified because of their historic utilization. And now with the expanded attribution methodology, we're also identifying individuals that can be attributed even if they don't necessarily have those historic primary care relationships. Uh, and those are individuals who might be brand new to Medicaid, who we wouldn't have historic claims for. Um, and so there's, I think, a little bit of both. But in 2019, in particular, where we saw that significant growth, that was largely attributable to an increase in provider participation. And, and Vermonters come and go off of uh, Medicaid, depending upon their life uh, circumstances. Is this just a, a total headcount or is a weighted average headcount or how do these numbers get calculated? So these numbers are what we use at the beginning of each performance year and we would consider this the maximum number of members that could be um, attributed to the ACO as of January 1st of that year. Uh, to your point, we do see members who are potentially losing Medicaid eligibility during the course of a performance year. And if they fully lose eligibility during the year, we would cease making payments to the ACO on behalf of those individuals, and we would cease counting any claims um, expenditure for those individuals beyond a point in time which they were no longer sort of full Medicaid benefits eligible. Um, we do allow members to come back in, though. So if someone was identified as being attributed for that January 1st period in time, they lose coverage for a couple of months during the year, and then they regain their coverage. They're considered uh, part of the attribution for all months for which they have Medicaid eligibility. If a Vermonter uh, became eligible for the Medicaid program, say at the end of January, beginning of February, and uh, we're on that program for the rest of the year, would they just not be counted? That's correct. If they became newly eligible for Medicaid at the beginning of the calendar year, we wouldn't be able to identify them as part of the attribution for that calendar year. They would be identified in the next year. Super, thank you. Certainly. All right, next slide, please. So the second result we wanted to highlight relates to uh, the financial performance, and we'll have several additional more detailed slides after this. Um, overall, ACO providers and Medicaid shared in financial accountability for healthcare in 2019. 
Diva and OneCare agreed on the price of healthcare services for the attributed population upfront, and the actual spending for those attributed members was more than what we expected in the setting of that price. Because OneCare shares financial risk with Medicaid, OneCare has to pay for a portion of the spending that's over the agreed upon price. Um, another thing that was particularly interesting for 2019 was that for the third year in a row, so now 2017, 18, and 19, we've seen providers who were receiving prospective payments spending less on expected services within their control, which highlights the potential of the changing financial incentives in this model. We'll dig a little bit more into that in a moment, um, but on the next slide, I wanted to offer just a quick summary for anyone who is thinking about how the risk arrangement works in the Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program. Uh, Diva and OneCare at the beginning of the year set an agreed upon price. And we can think about that agreed upon price as that green bar that says 100%. And it lines up with the blue dashed line and that represents the price. Around the blue dashed line, we have red and green dashed lines, which correspond to the upper and lower boundaries of a 4% risk corridor, which was what was in place for the 2019 performance year. And you can see on this slide, there's sort of a, a box that corresponds to each of the different scenarios for possible financial results. And it describes the different um, incentives and protections that are at play and why we have this risk corridor in the first place. So for any expenditure that would be above the risk corridor, so above that blue line, um, and if we think about the blue line to the red line, that would be what's described in the yellow box. Um, the ACO network is bearing full accountability for financial performance within that range. This creates an incentive to moderate costs and keep them as close as possible to that agreed upon price. However, if financial expenditure goes above and beyond even that risk corridor, so above the red dashed line, um, DIVA is going to bear full accountability for any performance that's in excess of the risk corridor. And this is an important protection for providers. Um, it allows them to change the way that they're delivering care, but it also protects against potentially catastrophic losses that could impact the ability of providers to participate in this kind of agreement year over year. Um, similarly, on the, the other side of the equation, um, between the blue and green dashed lines, anything in there is um, an amount of money that the ACO network would be entitled to retain if their financial performance was less than 100% of the agreed upon price, which again is the incentive to be efficient with resources, but anything below the green dashed line and outside of that risk corridor is returned to DIVA, um, which creates an incentive to spend money efficiently, but not to ration care. I think there's always the concern about um, there being an incentive to not provide services in the first place. And so having that protection on the other mm -hmm. side ensures that that incentive isn't in place. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Diva and OneCare agreed on the price for health care for the attributed population. And what we observed was that spending for ACO attributed members was approximately $13.5 million more than the expected price, which was overall about $203 million. Because the financial performance exceeded the agreed upon price, OneCare was liable for the full amount within that 4% risk corridor. So if we think back to the picture on the prior slide, they would be liable for the full amount between the blue dashed line and the red dashed line. And for 2019, that was approximately $8.1 million. After the application of other necessary adjustments as part of the reconciliation calculation, 
OneCare Vermont will pay approximately $6.7 million to DIVA uh, in the reconciliation for the 2019 performance year. And I think important to note here is if DIVA and OneCare did not have this risk sharing arrangement, the Vermont Medicaid program would pay the entirety of the amount in excess of the expected price. And so this is one of those rare circumstances in which some dollars, because of the risk sharing arrangement, are coming back to the Medicaid program. Next slide. This figure shows specifically the 2019 financial performance in a little bit more of a breakdown. Um, so for those who have seen this figure before, uh, hopefully the, the last figure was helpful orientation to what we're looking at here. Um, again, we have the blue, red, and green lines at the top corresponding to the price, the risk corridor around that price. And then within the bar, we have different segments for how much of the funding in the program was paid prospectively. And you can see in 2019, that was approximately $114 million. You can also see how much sort of within that price was paid on a fee-for-service basis. You can see $88.5 million. And then in the gray box at the top, we can see how much was paid fee for service above and beyond that agreed upon price. And that's approximately $13.5 million. And so when we're comparing the expected total cost of care, we're looking at the 203 million, which is everything below that blue solid line. And when we're looking at the actual total cost of care of about one, 216 million, we're looking at sort of the combination of the yellow, the orange, and the gray boxes all together. And you can see that all of those together extend beyond that red dashed line of the risk corridor, showing that financial performance was just outside. Next slide, please. So we did a little bit of additional analysis with OneCare and our prospective actuaries to try to understand what we were seeing in 2019. Um, one of the things that was noted uh, previously that I think is worth highlighting again is that the providers who were paid prospectively, so the providers receiving the payments in that yellow segment of the bar on the prior slide, um, spent about $8.2 million less than expected on services within their control. Conversely, providers who are paid fee for service, uh, and that includes both providers inside and outside of the ACO network, spent about $13.5 million more than expected. And this highlights how the two different changing financial incentives might impact the delivery and the cost of healthcare. And we think that this is a particularly interesting dynamic, uh, especially since we've now observed this several years in a row with our Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program that makes it worth continuing to test this model. Another important factor is that the ACO attributed population nearly doubled from 2018 to 2019. So thinking back to that first result that we highlighted, that 88% year-over-year growth in the population was a pretty significant change, and it introduced relatively more uncertainty into the rate-setting process than there would have been in prior processes. Uh, and that's because we're setting the rate based specifically on that attributed population. And so we had a lot of new folks with um, information that was being brought in and assumptions that were being made about them that we were building into the rate development process for 2019. And then the third thing we would highlight is that overall utilization trends increased for the entire Medicaid enrolled population between 2017 and 2019. 2017 was the base year that we used to develop the rates for 2019, and 2019 was the performance year. Um, but what we saw as we were looking at 2017, 2018, and 2019 to understand some of these dynamics was that utilization in 2019 was more similar than to 2018's utilization than it was to 2017, 
even though 2017 was the year that was used to develop the price. And so that's, uh, I think, just a feature of the rate development methodology that we have used and gives us some opportunities to think about modifications that we might employ in future as, as we think about ways to develop the rates in a more sort of consistent and predictable year over year manner. Alicia, uh, oh, okay. uh, on how, do, how should we look at the, um, the, the first bullet with the 8.2 million less for those who paid prospectively and the 13 and a half from those who play, who were not played prospectively. And then if you flip back to the prior slide to the total of 13.5 million, because the the sum of the other two would actually only show an overage of about 5 million. And I was trying to look at the 88 million and if they overspent by 13 million, which is 15%, and then the savings were on the 114 million, which I think was about a 7.6% savings, but it doesn't tie to the total 13 and a half. So just don't know where. Sure, so that's a, that's a really great question. And I think it relates most directly to how we think about the reconciliation of the prospective payments versus the reconciliation of the fee-for-service payments. Um, so as, as many of you may recall, one of the differences between the Medicaid program and the Medicare program is that within the prospective payment category or that yellow block, um, we are observing what the value on a fee-for-service basis of the claims that come in would be compared to that 114 million that is being distributed in the form of prospective payments, but we're not reconciling to that fee-for-service experience. Okay. And so even though we saw that the value of those claims was about $8 million less than the 114 million that was paid prospectively, um, we're not recollecting that and we're not factoring it into our reconciliation calculation. And so when we think about the 13.5 million in the total picture, that is almost fully apples to apples, the 13.5 million that we're seeing over on the fee-for-service experience. And then that 13.5, we would compare against the 88 million, that's a 15% overage. It's a 15% overage on the fee-for-service component, but we think about it relative to the total. And for the total, I think it was closer to, uh, no, I, want, I don't want, want to guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, thanks. Yeah, certainly. 6.7%. <laughs> okay, great. I think we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And this I won't spend much time on. This is more for everyone's reference, but we've had fun putting these uh, stacked bar charts together year after year. And uh, we have all three of the 2017, 2018, and 2019 performance years arrayed next to each other here for your reference. Um, there's also a box with some quick statistics for the number of Medicaid providers and members and for the total agreed upon price for each of those years. I think the key takeaway here just visually is that 2019 is a lot bigger <laughs> than 2018 or 2017. Um, we also had the risk corridor going from plus or minus 3% to plus or minus 4%. And so we had a widening of the risk corridor on a much larger number. And so just you know, quickly looking at the space between those red and green dashed lines each year, you can see that the corridor was actually quite wide in 2019 relative to the prior years. Um, happy to dig into this further if anyone wants to, but just wanted to include it so that you have it as a reference point. Next slide, please. So we'll wrap up with three more high level summary results for you and then a few concluding thoughts. Um, the third result that we wanted to highlight was that the ACO performed well against their quality targets in 2019. Um, One Care's quality score was 95% on pre-selected performance measures 
and OneCare demonstrated statistically significant year-over-year -year improvement on five measures. Uh, for those who may have participated in the October 7th meeting, uh, the quality results were presented in detail then, and we have linked to those if you want to dig into them in more depth. Next slide, please. The ACO also extended their care coordination model to more communities and people in 2019. Uh, we've seen year over year a steady increase in the percentage of high risk and very high risk attributed Medicaid members who are receiving care coordination interventions under OneCare's advanced community care coordination model. Next slide, please. And the final result that we wanted to highlight was that DIVA and OneCare have continued to make incremental programmatic improvements. Um, we work together to identify opportunities for improvement each year. And one of the key things that we focused on in 2019 was testing an expanded attribution methodology in the St. Johnsbury community based on Medicaid members' place of residence rather than their historic primary care utilization. Uh, this really was the foundation for broader thinking about attribution methodology changes that we implemented statewide in 2020 and that we are continuing to implement in 2021. Next slide, please. So to conclude, we just wanted to highlight a few um, of what we see as the benefits and opportunities for the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation Program um, from the DIVA perspective. First, the VMNG program has given Vermont Medicaid more certainty in budgeting than it would have had absent this arrangement for the last several years. And that's certainly a benefit to how we think about our program and planning for the future each year. The program also allows for more revenue predictability for the Medicaid providers who are participating in OneCare's network, uh, in particular, those providers who are being paid prospectively. The risk corridor, which we've employed each year and we've seen some modest changes to in 2019 and 2020, uh, ensures that there are both incentives to control, control costs and also protections for when actual spending is um, different from what we might expect. So we have kind of in combination this payment predictability and this risk sharing working together to try to build some more system stability over time. Um, I'll reiterate that the pro and fee for service spending patterns that we have observed in the first three years though not conclusive at this point in time, definitely signal the potential of changing financial incentives. And we're interested to see what that looks like as we continue to look at this program for the next several years. Throughout the implementation of the VMNG program, we have seen incremental improvements in quality performance for our Medicaid population and changes in the delivery of and coordination of care. And finally, we think that the opportunity to continue testing this model and to continue improving how we think about our rate setting methodology um, to allow for additional predictability in the future are um, things that we're particularly excited about in, in thinking about our 2021 performance year and then potentially um, another contract or series of contract terms that would follow after this one. So I will stop there and uh, happy to take any additional questions that folks might have at this point in time. Do board members have additional questions? Um, I have a couple. Go ahead, Jess. Is that all right if I go? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Alicia. I appreciate it, as always. Um, could you go to slide 15 for a second? So just looking at this um, and hearing about the relative success of fixed payment over fee for service in terms of the total cost of care um, results that you had, I'm wondering, I mean, if you look back in 2017, a greater proportion of the you know payments were actually fixed payment. And it looks like over time, the proportion of fixed payments is actually declining or stagnating. Um, I haven't done the actual calculations. This is just kind of a 
a quick visual look, but um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the desire to move more of the reimbursement into fixed payment. What are the services that are currently being paid fee for service? Who are the providers that are currently being paid fee for service? And given the successes in fixed payment, you know, what is the goal for 2021? What is the proportion going to look like in 2021? And, and who's getting the fee for service? Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Certainly. So your observation is correct. We have seen a little bit of a shifting in the proportions uh, from the beginning of the program uh, to more recent years. I think in the first year, it was approximately a one-third, two-thirds split for the fee-for-service and prospective payments, um, respectively. I think right now, we're a little bit closer to about 45%, 55%. Um, and so I'd say, you know, I, I would certainly welcome input from OneCare as well on this discussion because a lot of the, the split is really being driven by which providers in the network are electing to be paid on a prospective basis. And then the prospective payments that go from Diva to OneCare correspond fairly closely to um, how those providers are then going to be paid prospectively by OneCare. Um, what we've seen in the first several program years is that it's largely the hospitals that are being paid prospectively. Um, we've also seen uh, with OneCare's implementation of their CPR pilot, a number of larger independent practices that have been moving into the space of being paid on a prospective basis, which I think is a great trend um, and definitely represents some sort of opportunity as we continue to move forward in the program. Uh, the, I think the decision to um, be paid prospectively or continue to be paid on a fee-for-service basis is largely something that is uh, determined between one care and their provider networks and their contracting processes. And so I would certainly defer to one care on the details there. Uh, I think another thing that we would say is that while we would absolutely love to see some more movement away from fee-for-service and toward prospective payments, there will probably always be some need to have um, a portion of the total price be allocated to fee-for-service expenditure because our members have complete freedom of choice in where they receive services. And, you know, for instance, a member who's attributed might need more specialized care at Boston Children's Hospital or something like that. Um, Boston Children's Hospital is out of state and doesn't necessarily have a different type of payment arrangement in place with one care. So we would continue to pay them as we otherwise would as the Medicaid program. But then any expenditure that was accrued there for an attributed member would be counted as we're calculating this actual total cost of care for the attributed population. And so we'll always have some providers who are outside of the ACO network, um, including providers who are out of state, and those providers will always be paid uh, under, I guess, regular Medicaid reimbursement methodologies, whatever those look like at the time. Okay. Um, if you, can you go back to slide 14, actually? Okay. Um, I guess my question was around the last bullet point, overall utilization trends increased for the entire Medicaid enrolled population between 17 and 19. And I'm wondering if you've looked at the uh, difference between the ACO attributed population and the rest of the population to ascertain the difference in the growth rates. Overall, they both grew, did they grow at the same rate? I know that we did have some analysis that was looking at the comparison, but I don't remember the results offhand. So if it would be all right, I can I can coordinate with some folks on my end and we can try to get that information to you. Okay, that would really, be really helpful. Um, and then my last question was on slide 17, and this was around the, the, um, the high risk and very high risk uh, Medicaid members of receiving more care coordination. I'm just wondering, has there been, has DIVA done any impact study of having that increased uh, care coordination, how that's affected that population's either quality outcomes or cost, um, total cost of care growth, you know, seeing the impact of this increased care coordination. Has there been any study on that or evaluation of that? 
Unfortunately, at this point, we've not yet been able to tackle that specific question, but uh, but I agree that that is a fantastic analysis idea and we'll we'll convey that back to the rest of the team. Okay, right. thank you for your uh, answers. Other questions from the board? Hi, this is Robin. I just had um, really just an observation, which is I'm, I'm sure this has probably gotten more attention in legislative circles, but I do think it's interesting that in addition to providing more certainty for providers that are receiving fixed payments, that the program has also given the Medicaid program as a whole more certainty in budgeting. Um, when I worked at the legislature, which is now getting to be ancient history, uh, you know, it was not uncommon to have 10 to $30 million Medicaid shortfalls. Um, and it seems like I certainly, not that I'm following the blow by blow in the Medicaid budget these days, but I, I haven't been hearing those sorts of numbers. So I think that's a very promising uh, finding as well. Uh, yeah, Chair Mullen, can I speak to the, to Robin's point and, and thank her for the comment because it is absolutely um, uh, both to the payer and the provider, um, a reduction in volatility uh, in terms of utilization and, and you know, also caseload, of course, for the payer side. But um, reducing that variability uh, year over year is, a, is, um, a, is, I would say, a clear win for us. Um, definitely 19, um, those dollars that come back to the Medicaid program will obviously go into the Medicaid program um, at in some way, shape, or form um, in the coming months, year. So um, that is other dollars that won't be necessitated. Um, I, th I think that um, our efforts around um, getting more into value-based payments really speak to that as well, because that, I mean, it, it as, as Alicia referenced, we're probably never going to get to 100%. And in fact, when we first in 2017 considered the program said, We'd love to be 100% value-based payments and realize pretty quickly there needed to be some uh, dollars outside. But I would, to board member Yusufer's comments about the fee-for-service versus the um, the prospective payment, um, that that you know the overages, um, you know there is a, there is a analysis um, being done and, and has been done about where is that overspend and 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 in in large part it is those uh you know non part of the of the network providers a, spe a great example is children's hospital and other providers that, that um there are some in vermont that could be but aren't and so um we continue to to see that benefit so we we really are um i would say to you know i feel like we're we'll move away from diva here in a second but i will say this other takeaway is is um we have now these three years of results and we're starting to see these trends a trend doesn't mean a, a you know a certainty by any stretch but it does put us in a position as you all know um, letters from this federal government pointing in the direction of uh, value-based care and increased uh, focus on value-based purchasing puts vermont we already were considered a national leader but it really puts us in a good spot to give feedback to the federal government of what works and what doesn't work and uh, our you know our our activity to to allow the you know the prospectively paid to not do a reconciliation with those and i know the board members are aware of this but to not do a reconciliation on those prospective payments with the providers um is a is a you know widely regarded as a real positive as opposed to how the medicare program functions where they're prospectively paid and then they go the you know there's a reconciliation on those prospective payments which to me just adds a level of administrative burden. So, um, you know, we we think value-based payments changes incentives. We think um, that it can produce alignment in the in the delivery system. Something we want to see evolution in. Um, and but but uh, thanks for the point, uh, um, uh, board member Lunge, that uh, that reduction in volatility and and predictability in the dollars flowing through the healthcare system is really um, something we think is good for all sides. So, Thank you, Commissioner. Robin, did you have other questions or comments? No, I think everyone beat me to the punch, so I'm good. Thank you. Is there any other questions from board members? 
Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, Jess beat me to the first one, uh, you know, right on the money. But I'm just wondering, kind of over time, um, you know, as as uh, Diva went into the legislature for the 2021 budget session, they uh, specifically said that um, reimbursement rates wouldn't be raised except for where they were federally mandated. And so I'm just wondering about the relationship over time between fee-for-service and fixed prospective payments relative to reimbursement rates. I would think that if reimbursement rates for fee-for-service were constrained, that might push more people into or more providers into fixed prospective payment arrangements. But I'm wondering if you have any insight into that dynamic and the tension in that relationship, uh, given the three years you have under your belt. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent um, it's an excellent <laughs> column or, or strand of thought to, to apply to this. I mean, you know, the long term vision is to get away from using uh, the fee for service system as a backbone for what we put into the healthcare system. That would be a great place to get to. I, do, I don't know that we get there, um, you know, in the next two years, but it's it's something I think we aspire to. And I think we can um, we've started to think about it with more uh, reality. Um, I think one of the, the point you're one of the points you're making, though, and uh, intentionally or not, that there is a point about if the federal government, and this is kind of what I was getting at with the point about the federal government highlighting value-based purchasing as a and value-based care as a priority of theirs, at some point along the way, it is possible that even the federal government drives towards. Um, I'm just going to use an analogy here to make it simple for everyone, that the weather inside uh, value-based arrangement is better than the weather outside. There, we've already seen bits of this um, as a, in execute, executed by the federal government, but it's something we're also considering. I don't, um, I don't have, you know, here's the timeline or here's exactly how, but it is something to your point, I think, um, uh, member Pelham, that, um, you know, it, it, if you really want to create incentive, you want to make something look better in another place and, and less good in a, in the super service realm. So, um, you know, those, those different strands come together um, to have us certainly thinking about how do we um, create the incentive that the, that the value-based model is, is a better system for the providers, because as Alicia said, it, it really has been the choice of the providers in their agreements with the um, with the ACO of whether or not they are taking prospective. Well, it, <laughs> it might make me feel more kindly about the cost shift. You know, if it was uh, fee for service did kind of uh, lag behind fixed prospective payments and uh, and and pushing more people into value based. Uh, based payments just because of the dynamics of the relationship between the two. Yeah, I understand. Um, is it with, this is a, a, a long, a long time developed healthcare system. We're engaging in reforming and re, I know reform has been going on for a long time, but um, it's a, I understand the point. It's, it's, it's not lost on us either. Did you have other questions or comments, Tom? Uh, nope, I'm good. Jess hit that first one right on the nose. I was had it all noted out here to ask, and uh, she went uh, precisely where I was heading on that first question. Was that the question about the um, why the providers or the patients kind of and the services, or and why the the drop in perspective? Yeah, it was a, it was a question on proportionality over the three years and and fixed perspective payments seeming to. Um, lose it, you know, even though they had growth, they're losing a share of the total pie. Um, and I, I thought the answer was a good one. Yeah, good. And Kevin, I just to uh, hit on something that you asked about the populations, like the Medicaid population over time. So in that chart of 17, 18, and 19, um, we had ha we've been experiencing over those years decline in Medicaid population. So the growth goes against um, you know, reductions in Medicaid um, enrollments about, well, 4, 17, minus 3%, 18, and minus 3%, 19. We are obviously with the, uh, we've gotten the uh, 
pandemic. Uh, yeah, we got the pandemic uh, bump in FMAP, but that comes along with a uh, you know continuous coverage maintenance of effort uh, requirement, and so we aren't redetermining anyone right now, and people are staying on Medicaid. So that sort of revolving door that you mentioned, it really is a one-way door right now, and people are coming in. So we, we don't have a good sense of our numbers right this second, but we have seen it grow this year. Those previous years, though, it had been a decline. So those those um, two, the attributed lives and the total Medicaid enrollment had been going in different directions. <coughs> Did, what kind of assumptions did you use, Commissioner, um, for the coming year, um, given the fact that it's going to take a while for vaccines to be distributed? It's such a great question. We don't. We are working on. You mean the assumptions at achieving a 2021 contract agreement? Yes. Uh, it's a. It's just a good question right now. We're in. We're in negotiate contract negotiations, and this is uh, obviously that's a, a very big piece of the puzzle. Um, as you know, um, Medicare has already started to consider what it, what will what 2021 will look like in terms of all kinds of different aspects. But as far as assumptions on utilization, that's a I don't think we've arrived at anything um, sort of public ready at this point. I didn't know if you had a better uh, forecast than what we have seen, but <laughs> it's it's such a uh, really a look into a crystal ball and such a crap game. It's you know just. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the interesting point is that in 2019, with that expanding, basically doubling of the population and, and a real large list of new providers joining um, the, uh, the program, we saw that elevation um, in utilization and, and the exceeding of the estimated total cost of care. Um, you know, there's an assumption that as you shut down your system for an extended period of time in 2020, that you'll be producing, uh, you know, a, a less than the estimated total cost of care. We have seen healthcare bounce back. So it really is a matter of how do you deal with that um, segment of time where there was really very little going on because we really hadn't hit, we were in a, a, a medium phase of uh, cases and we didn't see a ton of hospitalizations. So. Um, due to the pandemic, but what we really did, the, the, the system did shut down for itself to prepare in case we did have a, a surge in cases. So yeah, you, um, TBD is really the answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Kevin, I just have one more quick one that came to mind. Um, I'm kind of looking down the road, let's assume that, um, uh, yeah, as we saw in, or you saw in, in 2019, that the overages were in fee for service and the fixed perspective payment, there were savings. And, you know, let's assume that that, that is the reality, that uh, if the system is working as those who hope for, felt, you know, uh, for healthcare reform uh, expect, that's the theory and it's working. How do you, um, so, so DIVA then developed some savings, um, at least in part of their port, their Medicaid portfolio. How do you keep that savings uh, in the Medicaid system to reward the, the fixed prospective payment folks um, for their good job and not let that money or the general fund portion of that money get siphoned off by the legislature to go somewhere else? You're on mute. Corey, you're on mute. Geez, I wish I had my t-shirt on that says you're on mute. I hear that <laughs> twice a meeting. I'm surprised that I'm the one this time. Um, it's a good question. Like every like every one of these questions, it's a it's a great question. I um you know, I believe that the legislature, it, it depends on the legislature, first of all, right? Who's there and who, I mean, I think that the legislature has been really great at understanding uh, where we're trying to go with this program. I think that um, they've also um, recognized, I mean, they're, they're just, there just is a reality of state budgeting. I do not, I probably do not have to to tell you that, but I, um, I think it's an ongoing conversation. I think that this program is far from baked. I mean, I think we really want it to evolve. I think that DIVA has seen itself and Medicaid, the Medicaid program and its contract 
remember this is just one piece and that's we have to get to the other uh, pieces of the puzzle but this program is just one piece um, I think that the you know we, we we continue to try to get our programs to look more and more the same and as we do that then the savings really start to accrue because the administrative burden of having even though we're we're in the same vein here across commercial across and um, and the government payers they aren't exactly the same so um, I know your question is about uh, any kinds of savings being preserved to you know go into the healthcare system and create a greater balance between government and commercial payers I think that's the the sort of thrust of the question I think it's a great question and something um, we're clearly interested in um, as we and and kind of get off that uh, hamster wheel of how much money do we have and then what do we do and um, it really by the way it is you know from the CMS administrator that's the current CMS administrator it's really the justification for moving towards value-based payments uh, at the federal level is so that Medicaid programs aren't necessarily um, just saying well how much do we have and that's how much we distribute um, accordingly so. Um, I know it's not a it's not a complete answer, but it it, it respects the, the the idea of the question, uh, Member Pell. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's proceed to the next panelist. Grace, are you available? You may have to unmute. I'm not sure if you've dialed in. Grace, it looks like you're unmuted. Are you also dialed in? Looking to see if anyone else is on from Blue Cross. Um, just confirming we're not having connectivity issues. I did hear the governor's press conference had some issues with Teams yesterday, so I'm not sure if we're running into that again. I seem to be the culprit every time I present, we have some sort of issue. Um, so, Grace, are you able to to speak, or anyone from Blue Cross for that matter, just to see if we can get through? It looks like Rebecca Colpans from Blue Cross is also on. Can you hear us, Rebecca? This is Sarah Teachout. Hi, Sarah. Hi there. I'm I'm texting Grace to see if she's available. Um, I don't think you would want me to give this presentation because I honestly, it's not an area that I have prepared at all. <laughs> Um, you know, I could read the slides to you, but I don't think that's what you're looking for. <laughs> okay, it looks like Rebecca can hear us also, but she can't get through either. So maybe that's the issue that Grace is running into. Um, so why don't I pivot? Okay, do you, perfect. Do you mind if we have Tom? Well, let's make sure we can hear Tom Boris from One Care. Tom, are you able to get through? Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All, right. All right. Yes. So then, maybe what I'll do is I'll just pivot. We'll do One Care only has a couple of slides, but we'll see if we can get Grace back, and then we can kind of go backwards if that's okay with everyone. Sounds like a good plan. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tom. Let me just advance to your slides. Hang on, just one second. Thanks. So hi everyone, Tom Boris, Vice President of Finance for One Care Vermont. I'm leaving you with, with really just two kind of simple thoughts that I think were important. Um, the first is 
really just to say that this value-based care stuff and the settlements are extremely complex. And I think um, for the benefit of us all to really explain what it's doing is important here. So to me, this is, this is all value-based care at work. And the slide that I prepared has two lines. The blue line is our targeted growth over time. I use the three and a half percent compounded just to stay consistent here. But if this is the goal of healthcare cost growth, while these settlements feel really complicated and we have things like risk corridors and sharing terms and mix of fixed payments and fee for service, really what these settlements are are reconciliations back to what we hope is this stable trend over time. And this is how we actually, despite the complexities of it, build stability into the healthcare uh, system across the state. And I just think that's a really important factor for uh, both this board, but also members of the public listening as well, to understand that when we, have, when we set these total cost of care targets, it gives all of us, the state, the ability to dictate what that blue line looks like. And at the end of the year, when we settle to it, we're reconciling to a more stable and predictable healthcare cost curve, which uh, we hope benefits from us all. This is a, an oversimplified example to prove that point. You do have other factors that are important in it overall. Uh, but I did want to just start with that and, and show this visual that I often think about, but don't really have an opportunity to share very often. So I, I took the chance today. Next slide. And then this slide here is designed to just answer the question, what happens to the shared savings if earned? And then how does one care fund shared savings uh, losses rather if owed back to the payers? So all of the contractual relationships are directly between one care and the corresponding payers, so Medicare, uh, Vermont Medicaid, DIVA, for example. But then we have contracts with our provider network to either receive or fund any of the losses that their owes or receives from those payers. And we have modified the way that we do this over time. In 2019, which is the year that you just heard about, we took those overall targets, broke them down by HSA, and then measured each HSA independently. Very complicated exercise to do that, which means that even though in Medicaid, uh, or I'll use Medicare, Medicare, for example, we earn shared savings, not every community uh, got some of those shared savings based on their individual performance. Where we're headed in 2020 and beyond is a different model that's a much more system-focused model where if there are shared savings earned, everyone gets a piece of those uh, dollars. And if there are losses owed, everyone contributes. So we all uh, hopefully rise together over time. Next, we have the sharing model within each HSA. So we really always broke down spend by the hospital or health service area. Uh, through 2020, the hospital was identified as the sole risk bearing entity for their HSA. And as we evolve into 2021, we are spreading accountability more broadly to include all attributing providers. I spoke about this in our budget testimony, but just want to make sure to cover that as well here as just to say that we're broadening those who have financial stake in the outcomes of these programs in spirit of really having rallied uh, effort behind driving positive performance and success long term under a value based care paradigm. And that's what I had prepared. I do have some thoughts on the uh, Medicaid fixed payment split over time, if you're interested. We would be, sure. Sure. So the, the change in the split from being more heavily fixed payment and less uh, substantially fee-for-service uh, is driven largely by our network growth. And what has caused the shift to move back towards a more 50-50 split is the inclusion of uh, attributing providers that are not receiving a fixed payment. So an example would be an FQHC. As you add the FQHCs in, all that FQHC spend is now included in the total cost of care that largely wasn't before. Because if you attribute to a hospital primary care, you're not very likely to go to an FQHC. But as we've included those FQHCs into the network over time, all that spend becomes part of the accountability and it's all still classified as a fee-for-service payment. 
So that's the reason you've seen that split or that change in the split over time. Um, and it's, I think, an opportunity for us to explore some additional uh, fixed payment programs over, over the next few years. Would there have to be uh, changes at the federal uh, level that would allow that to occur, Tom, or can we do that now? I don't believe so, but I'm not the expert on the federal regulations for FQHC billing. Deva might have some thoughts on that as well. It's an area that we've explored a little bit, um, but it's something I think we have an eye on uh, downstream. Okay, questions or comments for Tom? Hearing none, let's see if we can uh, we can hear Grace. Grace, are you on? Can you folks hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Well. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what happened, um, but sincere apologies. So, um, for the record, my name is Grace Gilbert Davis, and I am just approaching my eighth week in the position of Corporate Director for Healthcare Reform for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, and I'm delighted to be here today to discuss the financial outcomes of um, our 2019 uh, relationship with OneCare Vermont. Next slide, please. So because I come to you with 30 years working on the provider side and only seven and a half weeks working on the payer side, I thought it was worth just revisiting what the vision of Blue Cross Blue Shield is for my benefit and for yours. And we truly do believe that we can build together a, a transformed healthcare system for every Vermonter so they receive timely, high quality, low cost care. And our mission is we are committed to the health of Vermonters, to an outstanding member experience, and to responsibly manage the lives of the people that um, choose to, to work with the Cross for Shield of Vermont. Next slide, please. Thank you. So Andrew shared this slide with you when he went through the quality outcomes, um, I believe last month or the month before. Um, there were some great, great spots with OneCare this year um, in terms of our ability to work together and um, to continue to find ways to improve how we work together, how we share data, um, just generally keeping the lines of communication open and being as transparent with each other as possible. I think um, there's a, a wonderful sense of collaboration between the two organizations. And, you know, as a, someone with fresh eyes, um, I, it was refreshing to, um, to see that and to experience it over the past number of weeks. And to understand that um, the two organizations have worked together to successfully implement a commercial prospective payment plan system that is working. That being said, there have been some challenges um, and these come as no surprise to anybody, but just connecting um, you know, the current quality metrics to the actual impact of um, One Care Vermont on our members. Um, we're, you know, we're working already with the 2021 contract um, discussions around putting together um, a quality improvement work plan as a solution to this, um, because we do want to be able in the future to clearly demonstrate that um, members, one care, uh, members who are attributed to one care, you know, are seeing, are getting better care at a lower cost. Um, and obviously, like everybody, COVID-19 has disrupted just about everything, and that includes, uh, you know, our ability to, um, to engage in any new QI initiatives. Next slide, please. So these, have, again, these results are for small group and individual members. 
So our target was 557 per member per month, and um, the actual spend did exceed that by 6.5 million, which is net of you know the member cost share. So in a 50-50 risk share, which was the the um, the arrangement, one care would have owed um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont approximately you know three and a quarter million dollars. But there were some data challenges um, prior to my onboarding um, with the organization um, that I understand impacted uh, Blue Cross's ability to get data to one care in a timely fashion. And so as a result of that, um, we agreed to shift to a shared savings um, arrangement only um, for 2019. Next slide, please. So to summarize, after normalizing the results of the QHP population and to better understand normalizing, I'm not an actuarial and I, it's not in my plans to ever be one, but as I understand it, the, the way we did this was to limit the non, are we getting a, um, some kind of, if anybody um, is not muted, if they could mute themselves, it would be helpful because there is a, a little bit of an echo, but it, we can still understand you, Grace. Okay. All right. Um, again, normalizing, we limit the non um, one care Vermont cohort um, to a population that's attributed to non one care Vermont providers, and we exclude members from that cohort with zero claims. Um, we also normalize the medical spends um, by focusing on utilization um, analysis by inpatient, outpatient, and, profes and professional. Um, so after this normalizing, the attributed um, population results are 6.6% above target. Um, our analysis indicates that roughly 2% of this overage is related to adjustments to, um, to the premiums, approved premiums um, by the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and that the remaining 4% is unique to One Care Vermont attributed members. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, the data challenges that I, I mentioned in the, um, during the aforementioned um, slide, don't seem to have affected these outcomes. Um, next slide, please. So there were three dynamics that drove the overage. Um, and we spent considerable time analyzing this data. So there were significantly more ENM and uh, mental health substance use disorder visits than we had um, anticipated. Interestingly, a higher use of urgent care visits, which did not equate to a decrease in emergency department visits, and actually there was a slight uptick in the cost of emergency um, department visits. Um, that's a deeper dive that um, we'll be working on. Um, and then we found that the um, PT services that were utilized were either more costly and or more intense. And of course, if they're more intense, they're going to be more costly. There were some downstream effects. Um, one kid, adolescents who are attributed to one care um, received well care visits encounters at a much higher rate which, um, you know, in our current environment, um, I think is, is a good sign. It's a good trend. Um, but otherwise, um, uh, additional office visits are not yet showing or translating into reduced gaps in care. Um, 
the urgent care use, as I mentioned, did not reduce ER utilization. One of the things we are going to do um, after reviewing these results with um, the One Care team is we are going to look at the data across HSAs because we know that primary access to primary care providers in the rural settings in Vermont can be challenging. Um, there's only so many acute visits that are left open in a provider's morning and afternoon block. And once those are filled in the morning, and generally, you know, by 8.30, those, those visits are filled, those acute visits are filled, um, then either the patient will make the determination or the provider will encourage them to seek out, you know, urgent care. Um, so we're going to be looking across it um, to understand better why we didn't see a decrease in ED visits. Uh, next slide, please. We really enjoy working with One Care. It's a great team. Um, they're passionate about the work that they're doing. Um, we know that we're all on a learning curve. Um, so in, after we discuss these findings, um, we're going to dig deeper into the data. So how much more of the office-based care was uh, proactive and preventative? That's a question that was asked. We, we don't have an answer for that yet. Um, again, how does urgent care use differ across the regions? And we need to understand is the increased physical therapy expense tied to unit costs, or is it just that the services are are more intense? You know, the, that injuries um, necessitated uh, more intense and prolonged care. That is what I have for you. I am um, here to answer any questions that I can, but I will be honest with you. Um, I'm I'm not well versed enough to probably provide a lot of specifics, but we will be very timely in follow up with any questions that I cannot answer. And that's Kevin, it. you're on mute if you were talking. I need Corey's t shirt. <laughs> 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 so, um, Grace, what I was saying is that it, it's interesting that um, you're citing um, increased PT expenses because we repeatedly have received public comments from um, providers in the PT community that they're very frustrated with the lack of any increases in payments um, from commercial providers. And so um, it'll be, be interesting when you do that deeper dive to uh, get those results. Absolutely. And we also need to understand, um, you know, where, where in lies the difference? Are these hospital employees physical therapists or are, they, or are these private practice physical therapists? That'll be a key component to it. <laughs> um, with that, are there yeah. questions of Grace from the board? I'll go. Um, thank you, Grace, and nice to virtually meet you anyway. Uh, welcome aboard. Um, thank you very much. So a, a question about, a couple questions. One is about scale. We know that scale is such an important component of the model success. And so I'm wondering what role uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield can play in increasing scale. I know we've we've had conversations around um, the self-insured market and all that, but I guess given that this is, we're talking about the small, um, uh, small group and individual market here. I'm wondering what percentage of patient subscribers don't have who are in this market, in the exchange market, don't have a primary care provider and what role Blue Cross Blue Shield could play to make sure that they are uh, assigned or have, you know, um, incentivized, encouraged to, to become, to you know, to have a primary care provider and then therefore maybe be more likely to be attributed and included in the populations? Yes, that's a great question. I know that um, there is work, um, and I can't, be, I can't be specific because in the, I don't know how many um, meetings I've had in the seven and a half weeks, many, many meetings, there has been discussion about how do we reach out to those individuals who 
have not been in for at least an annual physical? Um, and how do we um, how do we identify who they are? How do we identify if they have a primary care provider? And if not, how do they get a primary care provider? Um, I, it's a work in progress and something that you know we are committed to helping um, increase scale, most certainly both in you know the small groups and and in large groups. Can I follow up on that, Jess? Of course, yeah. Grace, are there any incentives or disincentives that uh, are offered um, to try to make sure that that primary care visit occurs? You know, um, for your mom, that's an excellent question, and and I can't answer that, not even from the provider side. Um, so I I will have to find that out. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, Jess. Oh no, no worries. That was. Sort of what I was getting at anyway, so that's great. Um, my second question is around, so it's, you know, the spend was greater than the target, but some of, as you did a deep dive, it was interesting to see that some of the greater expense was in areas that we would like to see greater expense, right? We want to see more well care visits. We want to see patients that have mental health and substance abuse um, concerns seeking treatment, being able to receive the treatment that they need. So I'm wondering, um, and this goes back to questions that came up in the hearing. How much work does Blue Cross Blue Shield do in thinking about uh, high value care and low value care, right? High value care being the care that we know uh, gives you a bang for the buck, high rate of return on that investment. Low value care being care that's delivered that may or may not increase a patient's health or actually may harm a patient depending upon what the care is. So some of this looks like high value care that we would hope patients would receive. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've unpacked a little bit of that. Obviously, if we start paying uh, providers differently in a way that incentivizes high value care and disincentivizes low value care, patient outcomes should improve and hopefully costs will go down. But in, in the interim, we may be seeing a bump up in expense if there's just more high value care happening that hadn't been happening before. So how do you think about that? Again, that is something that I will have to follow up on. I, I truly wish I could answer that question, but um, at this time I can't. Okay. So a timely follow up within 24 hours. <laughs> you can have more than 24 hours. It's a, it's a <laughs> complicated question. <laughs> you know, a year from now, when you ask these these questions, it will not be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Other questions? I have, I have a question if uh, you're done, Jess. I'm done, thank you. Um, and I guess it's really more of a statement. Um, so on page 24, when you're talking about the performance, you attribute 2.3% of the overage to premium adjustments filed in the qualified health uh, plan premium process. So that led me to go back to uh, the 2019 rate filing. And what I found that uh, was linked to the 2.3% was a reduction that we made related to assumptions um, about association health plan uh, implementation. Um, and to quote from our decision, um, the, the re-entry of AHPs into the insurance market was on the horizon when Blue, well before Blue Cross developed its rate. Blue Cross chose not to include any potential rate impact in its initial May 11th, 2018 filing, even though it had already begun discussions with a number of associations interested in offering AHPs in the Vermont market. Um, but then five days prior to hearing, Blue Cross amended its filing to include what it projected to be a significant rate impact uh, from the migration of the small group population to the association health plans. Um, and what we basically found when we analyzed uh, the arguments and data that Blue Cross provided was that um, Blue Cross had not proven its case in relationship to the migration of association health plans. And so that combined with the fact that when um, we look to what 
to what actually happened, which was that Blue Cross was actively marketing association health plans to small group members to pull them out of the market and into the association health plans. I really don't think the statement on on uh, slide 24 is factually or legally accurate. I think it's really a public relations statement. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, for me personally, I would really like to request that this slide be updated to be more accurate. I think it's fine to um, indicate that, you know, Blue Cross didn't get everything that it asked for in, in its rate filing, but the reason it was not approved is because the case was not made. Um, in addition, I would also like to point out that in our 2019 decision of the ACO budget, the conditions on the ACO related to the commercial marketplace is that the one care provide the board with an actual actuarial certification for the commercial benchmark stating that the benchmark is adequate but not excessive and we did receive such an actuarial certification so um, i think really part of what uh, in looking at the benchmark versus the premiums we have purposely left open given that we're deciding the premiums in july and deciding the um, ACO budget in December. And quite frankly, the Blue Cross contract has never once been finalized prior to our decision making on the ACO budget. Uh, we leave it open for negotiation to ensure that when you get the attribution in the individual and small group market, that you're able to negotiate a benchmark that reflects that population, given that you have much more up to date information in January than. Uh, certainly, we all had in July. So um, I absolutely do not expect you to be able to respond to this, Grace. Um, and I apologize that you are the messenger that <laughs> with no, this. No, no, slide. that's fine. Um, that's fine. You're uh, educating me. I really just want to object to that statement on the slide and ask that it be corrected. Duly so noted. And thank you for the feedback. You're welcome. Are there other questions or comments for Grace? So I think that we've been through um, all the uh, panel. Am I missing anyone, Sarah? You're, this is Michelle. You're not missing anybody. Great. Thank you. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment or questions, members of the public. And uh, Julie Wasserman. <laughs> Yes, um, I have a question for Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm interested in the financial results for 2019 for the Blue Cross One Cares Blue Cross Blue Shield self-insured program, and uh, uh, also, we're also interested in the quality performance for the self-insured uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield program. And Ms. Wasserman, I am um, apologetic again. I will have to. Um, follow up and get that information for you. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, are there, are there other public comments or questions? And I see that Susan Aronoff has her hand up. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, the rest of the board, um, everyone, staff. So I have, um, uh, one follow up for Blue Cross, and I just want to echo um, Julie Wasserman's request for the um, self insured information and hope that that gets presented to the board as well, um, because I think it's really relevant. But in the slides and in the testimony, there was an indication that the square up for 2019, that there's going to be some sort of, sort of shift to it being shared savings for 2019. So my question is a little bit, could we get more information on that? And how would that affect a uh, scale target attribution for the year 2019? Does the board have a process for going back in time, like to qualify for scale and to have been reported as scale? It couldn't have been shared savings, but if now it's gonna be trued up as shared savings, would um, the scale numbers be trued up as well?
And I do have questions about the other um, presentations, but I sort of just want to take the Blue Cross one first. Well, again, um, if you ask me these questions in a year, I will be able to answer them promptly and um, with full knowledge. Um, I'm definitely hearing, and I too am interested um, about the self-insured um, piece. And so we will um, come back to um, the board with that information. And as for um, the scale question, I will have to go back to our actuarials and um, find out the answer for you. Part of that question, actually, Mr. Chair, was was for the board, or um, I don't know if you'd turn that over to, to Mike or someone for an opinion on that, but um, if there is a change after the fact, how would the board address that? Mike, so having, you have, go I'm ahead. Sorry, I don't want to speak for Mike, but I did just look at uh, over lunch at the 2019 order, um, and the order required it did not require a particular risk sharing arrangement. So shared savings does count towards scale under the all pair model agreement. So I don't think the scale numbers would need to be adjusted uh, because uh, shared savings is allowed as part of scale. Um, but I would defer to Mike. I don't think there's a direct con uh, contradiction to the order itself. Um, yeah, just speaking, I don't know the particulars of the shared savings arrangement, but Robin, you're correct that the all payer model agreement in, in defining uh, ACO scale qualifying initiative does not require risk. Uh, if there's going to be shared savings, it requires a certain percentage. So I think that would be kind of the issue, uh, but I don't, I don't remember the specifics of the uh, arrangement. So. But will there be some sort of rec? I guess what I'm wondering is, does the board have a mechanism for a retrospective review if it turns out that whatever the arrangement was that was agreed to in 2019 is then changed on true up? Does the board um, look to see if it does comply with its orders and terms? Yeah, I don't know what what order you're you're referring to obviously we, re we report scale to to cms cmmi um so it would have to be uh a part of that reporting any sort of true up um which you know i haven't talked with the staff about so i'm not prepared to talk about it and susan you said you had other comments yeah, I was um, wondering, and this was in something, reference to something that Commissioner Gustafson said, and I don't know if he's still present or not. Um, so if he is, maybe he could respond directly. But at the me meeting on Monday, he seemed to make a statement uh, where there was a presentation on um, uh, One Care and also on the, the performance improvement plan. Um, he seemed to make a statement that would imply that where we're Medicare is seeming to not just want reconciliation to feed a service, but actually to recoup some of the prospective payments that Medicare made, whereas Medicaid is not doing that. So I was just looking for a clarification, like, is it just the reconciliation that the commissioner was referring to, or is Medicare actually seeking repayments um, uh, from providers that receive prospective payments, value-based payments that for services that were not provided during the pandemic. It's the, it's the same comment I made, um, Sue, about the prospective payments being reconciled against um, actual care delivered in the Medicare program, and it seems to fly. Um, the comment I made on Monday and today is it seems to fly in the face of the value of flexibility, that prospective payment, and the predictability of dollars available to a healthcare system to perform uh, healthcare and deliver it differently. Um, it, it seems to not allow for that kind of flexibility if you're going to go back and go through an administrative exercise to, to um, reconcile against how much, um, you know, prospective payment versus how much was done in a, in a claims-based, um, uh, reconciliation. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So Medicare isn't actually 
um, reaching, you know, for any sort of clawback related to prospective payments during the pandemic or anything like that? This is just the bookkeeping aspect. Um, well, I'm not Medicare or the ACO, but I think that you could ask okay. the ACO okay. and I think you could answer that. Okay. Thank you. That's it for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Is there any other public comment? Kevin, Mike Fisher here. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am focused on the 29th of Medicaid 2019. Uh, the the sort of the interesting data in um, the 8.2 million dollar um, savings in the prospective payment um, category and the 13.5 million dollar uh, uh, loss higher expenditures and and I, I uh, Alicia and I had a little bit of this conversation across the table at the MEB um, but um, I, I I guess I just wanted to ask this question again in a in a, in a bit of a higher level. Um, you know, two theories. One of them is proof in the pudding. It's working. We are seeing providers behave differently when you pay them prospectively. Um, another possibility is that we have a uh, two diff very different sets of providers out there that have maybe been pretty well sorted by the um, choosing to belong or not to belong to um, to the network, to OneCare, um, and that those providers behave differently, and, and that's what we're seeing here. Um, and then I then I also I um, let me see if I can get this open quickly. I noted that that the the fee for service line was both in network and out of OneCare network, and I guess I just wanted to ask. I I think. Um, I'm reading in the charts below that that is uh, about evenly divided, that the fee-for-service expenditures were are, are pretty evenly divided between in-network and out-of-network. Um, so I, I put all that back in, in front of, I'd love to hear Tom's perspective on, on you know, what do we really see going on here? Um, and, or I'd also love to invite Alicia if she has further comments about um, sort of what's the theory here? Um, in response to sort of the points I put back in front of us. Tom or Alicia? I can I can speak to those briefly and welcome Alicia as well. But I guess in regard to the first question about whether or not providers can select to participate in the fixed payment model based on their perceived ability to do well under it, mm. um, I don't think that's the case. And the reason I believe that is that we've offered a fixed payment model for hospitals since really the beginning of our programs. And as of uh, today, we have all Vermont hospitals except for one um, participating and accepting the fixed payment. So if we saw a mix of some hospitals saying yes to the fixed payment and some hospitals saying no to the fixed payment, there might be some credence to what you're saying, um, Mike. But uh, because everyone's jumped in and we've seen similar results, at least in aggregate. Uh, I don't think that's the case um, right now. As for the mix of the fee-for-service between in-network and out-of-network, uh, I don't have the split in front of me. 50-50 um, seems about right based on my recollection. The important uh, thing here is that an ACO model is a population or person-based spending accountability. So when a primary care provider attributes a patient they become responsible for that patient's total cost of care and quality, regardless of where they go. So their primary care is, is kind of the quarterback for their care in a lot of ways. Um, and making their decisions in spirit of really efficient and effective health care uh, and value-based care, that naturally will include services provided both by one care providers and non-one care providers could mean that uh, a primary care refers uh, a patient using their best judgment to a, a practice or a provider that's not participating in one care. There could be um, a bad circumstance where somebody has to be referred out of state um, to Boston or something for a unique treatment. So the, the mix of fee-for-service in and fee-for-service out is just a, it's just a dynamic that comes when you build these population-based models that focus on 
uh, healthcare costs for an individual person. So, Tom, do you have a theory as to why there's such a different outcome here between the perspective and the fee for service? I do. I mean, I think that when you put financial incentives and um, com probably combined with penalties, I don't think one or the other is necessarily better by itself. But when you put financial incentives in place, it does change behavior. And it, and I can say over the past few years, we've had an HSA accountability model or healthcare spending model that was very hospital focused. And the hospitals were those that accepted the fixed payments. And over time, I've seen much more engagement from those hospitals because they have financial accountability. And I think that is panning out here. We're, we've, I mean, I still go back to my first year at One Care. There was the Medicaid program was two sided, and then there was upside only for Medicare and commercial. Basically, all we talked about was the Medicaid program. That's where the attention was because that's where the financial accountability was as well. So I think over the past few years, we've really seen the effectiveness of financial accountability. And that started with the hospital. That's where it's been under the fixed payments. And so just the last point, then then I take it the, the right thing to do to deal with the over expenditure in the fee for service line is is to just get as much of that as is reasonable into a prospective payment. I think that's a strategy. I think Coupled with that is a strategy to broaden financial accountability beyond the hospitals, which is what we're trying to do in 2021 with the new risk sharing model. You don't have to have a fixed payment in place, but having financial accountability of some sort, I think is really important as we move forward. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Is there other members of the public who wish to comment? Seeing none, I wish to uh, thank the panel for um, a very uh, informative uh, uh, discussion. And um, we are now going to move on. And Michelle, if you could stay on screen, because we are going to shift to you and Lindsay for an update on the all payer model. We are. Just give me one second while I reload slides here. Can you see my slides and does it say all pair model update? It does. <laughs> okay, because my screen share was still showing financial and I was like, this cannot be right. <laughs> Either that or I left the same title on both slide decks, which is entirely possible. Uh, so uh, Lindsay and I are here today to talk to you about uh, 2019, which is performance year two, uh, kind of interim all pair model update. I know we typically in the past have done these to the board as frequently as quarterly. And I think, you know, just seemed a good time to really check in and see where we are um, in terms of finalizing some of our 2019 data. Um, so I, I will start by just kind of reminding folks, you know, we 2019 data that are included here are not complete. We are in performance year three, which is 2020, we're about to or about to talk about the 2021 proposed budget from the ACO. So I know we're kind of treading through three years here. Um, I'll try to keep it as clear as possible as we move forward. But for the almost every point in this presentation, we're talking specifically about 2019 performance year two of the all pair model. Um, so with that, a uh, quick agenda for today, just what we're gonna talk through. Um, we are going to talk today about the 2019 results again that we have to date. Um, just a friendly reminder, claims take a while, analysis takes time. Uh, we're working to finalize all results by year's end uh, for the most part, but given the current state and just regular, uh, you know, data delays that we've experienced in the past, um, we could encounter some sort of reporting delays as well. Um, also, just a quick note that Last week, you heard about the uh, all pair model improvement plan. Um, we haven't quite included any of that here in this uh, presentation just yet. Um, I think, you know, to be expected as we sort of move through and start talking about future years. But for this, again, just performance year two reporting, and we'll work with our uh, signatory partners to incorporate those improve improvement plan objectives into future reports. 
so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay Kill, and she will walk through um, some of our preliminary 2019 uh, total cost of care results. So, Lindsay. Thank you, Michelle. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. I can. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, as Michelle said, my name is Lindsay Kill. And I'm a member of the GMCB analytics team under Sarah Lindbergh. Um, yep, next slide, Michelle, thank you. So before I get into some results, I just want to reiterate um, what Michelle just said about background. The results that I'm about to show are with three months of claims run out. We do not consider results final until there are six months of claims run out on the books. And that in with this current year um, 2019 there are three years for medicaid participation in the model and two years for medicare and commercial participation in the model next slide please so here we are comparing expenditure measures that we have um, at our fingertips here at the board the scale here is the proportion of total expenditures on behalf of Vermont residents. So that's that 100% there is what we capture in our expenditure analysis, uh, expenditure analysis projections for 2019. And that's in millions. So it's, um, it's roughly $6.5 billion is the total Vermont resident spend. And then in the center, we have the all payer model total cost of care for 2019. So in 2019, this represented about 46% of the total spending on behalf of Vermont residents. And again, this scale is in millions, so this is approximately $2.9 billion. And lastly, all the way to the right, we have One Care Vermont's total cost of care based on their uh, 2019 actual figures. And um, in 2019, this was about 10% of the total spending on behalf of Vermont residents, which was $637 million. Next slide, please. So what this slide is showing here is going back to the same chart, just giving a little bit more context um, the remaining 54% for the all-payer model total cost of care, I'm sorry, that, that's not included in the all-payer model total cost of care, and why it's different from our expenditure analysis projection are, these are just some of the reasons. So the all-payer model total cost of care does not include um, uninsured Vermont residents, does not include federal employees with federal health plans, workman's compensation, retail pharmacy, dental expenses, and government health care activities, which are mostly Medicaid. Um, it doesn't include long-term institutional care for commercial and Medicaid, and it doesn't include skilled nursing for Medicaid. And then um, just to kind of connect the one Care Vermont total cost of care to some slides that Michelle will talk about with scale. The 10% figure you see here, the 637 million, is on behalf of 30% um, of the Vermont population because, as we know, One Care Vermont total cost of care is specific to their attributed lives. Um, and so in 2019, it's about 30%. Next slide, please. So the question that we're going to answer today is how did the per person total cost of care change from 2017 to 2019 for Vermont residents? Below is the equation that's used to calculate that difference and the resulting difference is it's changed 4.2%. As a reminder, the range um, for the all-payer model agreement is actually 3.5% to 4.3. So 4.2 is on the higher end of that, but it is still within there. Um, and also just want to remind uh, us all again that even though we do monitor year-over-year -year change, our performance is assessed for growth from that first year, 2017, to through the end of the model or for right now to date. So it's really about the compounding annual growth. 
Next slide, please. So on this slide, we are showing the all payer total cost of care by payer type. And here I've also included some estimates um, for what 2019 final numbers could look like. Um, because again, we need three more months of run out. So that very first row is from the na uh, is a national trend on the total spend um, annual percent change from 2017 to 2018. That's based on the national health expenditures data set. Um, they didn't have 2019 yet, um, but when we do, when they do, I'll. We'll definitely fill it in here so that we can see how the year over year change looks compared Vermont compared nationally. But that's it's 4.8%. And so that's a good number to just keep in mind as we look at these rates by payer. So the way that you would read this table is that for the all payer model in 2019, with the current data that we have, only three months of run out the per member per month cost is $544. We've estimated that with an additional three months of claims run out, that will land somewhere between $500 and $558 per member per month. In the first, sorry, between the first and second year, we saw 4.1% growth. And between the second and third year, sorry, that's a little confusing, between PY1 and PY2, we are expecting a range between 5.5% and 7% um, to see change. Again, that's just between one year. What, what we're really interested in is that overall compounded annual growth. And for the all payer model, we are estimating that that could land between 4.8% and 5.5% overall. Um, and you can see the totals. That's how. That's exactly how you would read the rest of the chart for each of the payers. So um, we see some big change in commercial between PY1 and PY2. Um, that's affected their compounded annual growth. Um, so, but everything else looks um, in line with that 4.8%. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Sure, Lindsay, I just wanna pop in and remind folks here that there is no um, target for annual growth. So we are only held accountable for that performance year five compounded growth. I just want to reiterate that one more time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. So this, thank you. So this next slide um, is just another way to look at the share of the total cost of care by payer versus the population by payer. So the way that we would read this is that uh, Medicare, for example, takes 44% of that two. 2.9 billion dollars for the total cost of care in terms of the, the dollars, the expenditures, but their patient population for their member months is only um, 27 percent. So that's how we would read this chart. So we can see that Medicaid um, uh, has 15 percent of the total cost of care um, expenditures, but they have 28 percent of the member months in the model and commercials more even. They have 42% of expenditures and 45% of member months. And next slide. Great. So this is just going over next steps. So as I've said a couple times, we really want those six months of run out for final report production. And that relies on data from Medicare. And we anticipate that in early 2021. Um, one consequence, um, just you know, thinking about you know the end of year five, that compounded growth rate. One consequence of COVID nineteen is that we do expect the compounding growth through twenty twenty to be lower, um, for better or for worse. And um, also, we just want to add that once we have final data for this year, we will be completing more nuanced analyses on growth as in what does that look like um, in state versus out of state and 
other examples. So I think that that is all for me. Thanks, Thank Lindsay. you. So I will uh, turn it over now and start talking just briefly about our 2019 scale targets and alignment. Um, you've heard staff uh, speak about this as well. I know Elena and Sarah Kinsler um, spoke to the board about the scale warning letter. So this particular um, set of slides does not necessarily focus on the improvements or the strategies um, implemented there. Again, it's just a review of where we're at for performance year two of the model. With that said, so we'll start with our all payer scale. Uh, so as we know, we've not met targets to date and current projections do show that continuing. Uh, the results here for 2020 and 2021 all utilize the 2019 population estimate. I just wanna emphasize that it's very likely that these um, can change once we do have those updated population estimates. This is something that we run into every year when we get the ACO's budget projections and are able to sort of um, make these analyses. But I just wanted to point out that once we are able to get, for example, the 2020 uh, population estimates, we will update both 2020 and 2021 with those newer population estimates. So right now, um, the uh, APM year three, which is what we're in now, 2020, um, is again still using preliminary results based on attribution from pair contracts. Um, these reports become final in June the year following. That's when they're submitted to CMMI. Uh, so we'll have that um, prepared and on time for June of next year. Uh, preliminary uh, year four are utilizing uh, results from the ACO uh, or projections, I'm sorry, from the ACO that we received through their budget submission for performance year four of the model. Again, for Medicare scale, uh, here we're missing scale targets. Same caveat, these data utilize for 2020 and 2021 do utilize the 2019 population estimate. Um, I'll reiterate a point that's been shared before. Um, and you know, I think Sarah Lindbergh has said this. I know Elena and Sarah Kinsler have also pointed this out. Um, you know, in the past we have run some analysis specifically on Medicare providers, and um, it was noted that even if all Medicare providers participated, we would never reach the scale targets that were set forth in the agreement. Um, so I know that's part of the, the scale discussions moving forward. Um, but again, this is just sort of a, a look right now for um for what we're, what we're moving towards for performance year uh, three and four. So again, uh, discussed the scale performance and warning letter at the uh, board meeting last week. Um, in terms of strategies and next steps, the final year of the model performance year five or 2022 um, will show the potential impact of these strategies that are set forth in that response. Next year's scale report will be fine. So next June, we'll have a final 2020 report. That report will include projected 2021, since we'll have a better idea at that point in time. Projected 2022 results will be available again once the ACO presents and submits its 2022 budget based on contract negotiation, negotiations at that point in time. Um, so we're kind of always on a rolling basis here, but um, final 2020. June 2021 is when that report will be submitted. Um, and in terms of, um, oh, I'm moving, I, look at me, just moving on. Uh, quality and population health outcomes. Again, um, as Alicia pointed out earlier today, we talked about this back in early October, um, but I, I'll just give a brief update of where we are in terms of the model expectations. So stepping away from uh, payer reported uh, ACO contract uh, quality performance and moving into all payer model quality of performance. As Lindsay stated, we need six months of run out to produce uh, some of our claims level measures that are required as part of the model. And most notably, there are going to be HEDIS measures. Um, as a reminder, the 2018 report was published in February of 2020. So while we are working to collect some of that data uh, necessary to complete that report. Um, you have to remember that we also rely on our partners at the health department um, and other state agencies for some of this information. And we know that they have been very busy in the COVID response. And so we want to respect that, um, the possibility there for again, some data delays based on um, what we need to populate this report and absolutely honor all the work that they're doing. And um, so we will keep you 
posted as as this um, time frame may fluctuate based on data availability from both uh, claims level and state partner. Um, I also just wanted to sort of give a little preview of uh, staff work that is planned or in progress. Um, we're looking at assessing trends over time or a way to be able to assess trends over time, um, sort of looking at that in and out of the ACO. So uh, who are the quote unquote stayers in a program? So uh, being able to sort of look at quality performance from the beginning of uh, the all payer model, so 2018, and looking at their health outcomes as they've progressed through the program. Um, because of some limitations, we do know they would have to be within the same payer program for us to be able to effectively track them, which will make our cohort a little bit smaller, uh, but it's something that we're looking to do as we move forward. Um, in addition, we want to look at the ACO impact on the all payer model quality and population health outcomes. So we do ask the ACO each year in their budget to talk about any initiatives that they're working on within their communities that might help address some of the larger population health outcomes that are um, part of the all payer model. Um, and we want to really try to do um, a deeper dive there. So as I said, sort of uh, following that, uh, assessing the trend over time, you know, where possible, looking at the potential impact of the ACO in some of those communities, perhaps, and seeing um, if some of those health outcomes are changing. Uh, in addition, um, we're looking at uh, conducting an analysis of ACO provider performance over time. So um, I think Alicia had sort of pointed to this in her earlier presentation, but looking at um, how providers perform within the ACO compared to providers who are not part of the ACO or were not ever part of the ACO and seeing um, sort of the differences or similarities there. So just a heads up that those are some things that we're hoping to look at and, and I really hope to be able to bring you uh, in 2021 um, at least an update on where we are with some of that. Um, and as a note, I think this is like one of everybody's favorite slides. Uh, upcoming reporting for uh, the all payer model and the purposes of uh, meeting our requirements in the agreement. So this is our updated timeline for 2020. Um, italicized reports here have been completed. Um, this graphic utilizes agreement deadlines, and I just want to emphasize that some of these could change based on data availability. Um, you know, our federal partners have been very amenable to those changes, especially in light of COVID. And so um, we do try to give everyone, all signatories, um, as much of a heads up as possible once we are um, warned of sort of that uh, possibility. So. For right now, uh, let's dive into the reports that are upcoming. Um, so with that, we have um, the pair differential report that's gonna be delivered as a package. Um, it will be the annual pair differential report, which is section 10A of the agreement, pair differential assessment report, section 10B, the pair differential options report, and the uh, yeah annual assessment options. There it is. Uh, and so we'll be uh, preparing that and submitting it as a package uh, for December 31st submission. Um, we currently have a draft and are working with our state partners on that um, and look forward to bringing that forward to the board uh, early in 2021. Uh, annual state health, health out comes and quality of care, as I said, will be delivered as soon as data allow. Again, last year it was in February. Um, and again, run out is required specifically for the calculation of those HEDIS measures. Um, the plan to integrate mental health, substance use, and home and community-based services within the financial target services. That is a report that is uh, designated to our um, agency partners and it um, at this point, the agency is proposing to delay that report so that it better aligns with some of the future APM planning that they've been working on. Um, and that does really kind of make great sense. Um, and we are in support of that. So that will be up to them to um, put forth the request to our federal partners. And I will keep you all posted as to the status of that as well once we receive um, word that that request has gone through. And that's it. That's all we have for you today. I know this was a very short and sweet update and uh, not as robust as we would typically hope, but 2020 is not as anyone hoped either. So uh, I just 
uh, any questions for Lindsay or I uh, to walk through what we know so far about 2019. Questions for the board? Yeah, I had a question for Lindsay on, I think it's page eight. Just looking at sure. the, the compound annual growth rates, are those derived from the prior two years? I was having a hard time because a few of them like um, Medicare, the first year of the 4.9, on the compounded growth rate is higher than the 4.4 or the 1.5. I understand the 1.5, you know, the year two may go higher, but I'm just not sure how we could get a 4.9 and a 5.6 range. Just want to talk about that. And then same with Medicaid, which maybe there's a third year in there, but the 2.9 is below the 6.5 and the 3.8. So just because it's so critical, obviously, what the total compounded rate is going to be. I just want to make sure the calculations were correct. Yep. Yeah, so what I did, and I will definitely go back and check my math, but um, I took the 2017 rate, which is not shown explicitly okay. in this table. I yep. think at one point I did have every year's rate and the growth and the compounding annual growth, but it was a really busy table. Um, yep. So the 2017 rate is the the denominator basically of that um, equation. And then the, so for the range, I used the ranges that you see in column three, the 2019 estimated range. Basically for each calculation, I used the lower bound and got okay. one um, rate. And then I used the upper bound and got the other rate. And that's how I came up with a, an estimated compounded annual growth range once we get those additional three months of run out and I could send I can definitely double check the calculations and I can send them to you sure yeah that'd be good can you just send them okay. that thing? Okay. okay thanks well we're on that slide um Lindsay um I was trying to figure out um how the range for all payer could be 500 to 558 when you're already at um 544 and is that because you you don't have confidence in the percentage of the three different groups or how would it end up being lower? Um, I can't, I'll definitely double check the calculation, but the, the total, that total range is a function of the, um, so it's the total cost and then it's the all the members so depending on what i did was we used other years additional three months of run out to see how much that really impacted by payer and the additional three months of run out does not impact payers equally um and so i can share those calculations um but sarah Lindbergh and i worked on those. And so I think basically some payers, they don't, we don't expect as much growth. So that kind of drags down that average, even though the PMPM um, remains the same. It's unlikely that it will go down, but yeah. Unlikely, but not I think it might be a typo. Sorry, because I'm think it looks like it maybe it should be 550 to 558 because as, as all of the ranges increased from the first column. So the 882 went to the bottom is 891, the 503, 508, 283, 286. They all went up by about five bucks. So it seems like the 544 maybe should be 550, but you guys can check on it and then. Yep, yep we'll double check. Did you have other questions, Maureen? No, I'm good, thanks. Okay, other questions from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment? Hearing none and seeing no hands raised, um, I want to thank uh, Michelle and Lindsay for um, providing us with that update.
And um, at this point, uh, we will move on to, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.